I once watched an, uh, an interview with uh, Muhammad Ali, the, the boxer, while he was a heavyweight champion of, uh, of the world. And he was explaining in this interview how he knocked people out. And they questioned him because if you know anything about boxing, he wasn't what's called a power puncher. You know, he wasn't one of those guys like with one punch he could take you out. He wasn't that kind of a fighter, and yet he knocked out a lot of people and he explained his method of knocking people out. He said it wasn't only one big punch, but rather a series of blows that usually brought his opponents down. He explained that a rapid combination of blows caused a, a kind of a short circuit in the brain in other words, the brain couldn't process all of that information and for a moment the person would lose consciousness. And that's how he scored a lot of his, uh, a lot of his knockout victory. He was a very fast uh, puncher, very interesting. Uh, also interesting that um, um, we note that Ali, who knocked so many people out and was never really hurt himself, was struck by Parkinson's disease um, which causes the same kind of short circuit to the brain and eventually led to his death in 2016 at the uh, age of 74. I remember his uh, knockout example because it explains perfectly how a person is knocked out by sin. There's a, a relationship here. It is rarely only one sin that makes us fall. Rarely just one sin that you know, gets us into trouble or hooks us into a, a bad habit. No, it's usually a rapid combination of things that brings us to the point where we fall. And sometimes we don't ever get back up again. So tonight I, I want to look at a man who is KO'd by sin and hopefully learn a, a strategy, if we wish, to defend ourselves against this happening to us. So I want to talk about Herod, King Herod. He's the one who was KO'd by sin. He's going to be my example tonight. Uh, in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 16. Just want to read this passage just to kind of get us going. It says, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So this particular Herod here, he was the youngest son of, the, of Herod the Great, uh, the king who received the Magi when Jesus was born and, and, and ordered all of the children under two years of age to be killed you know, hoping to get rid of Jesus, uh, and he did this to protect his, uh, his throne. This Herod right here that we're talking about in Matthew. There's another Herod we're going to talk about in a moment, so I don't want to get you confused. But I want to talk about his, uh, you know, his lineage here. This Herod right here in Matthew, Herod the Great, he had also killed some of his wives, some of his own children, in order to protect his throne. Um, and he left his sons to reign after him. Now one of these reigned during Jesus' ministry. Uh, he thought uh, that Jesus was the reincarnated uh, John the Baptist who was coming back to haunt him for having uh, executed him unjustly. And so in this background we see blow number one that Herod sustained in his KO by, by sin. Not this Herod, but the other Herod who was alive during Jesus' time, he's the Herod I'm talking about. He's the Herod that was KO'd by sin. But I read this passage here to give you where this guy comes from and his, you know, the first blow. And the first blow was a poor example and lack of teaching by his parents. Imagine if your dad was Herod. <laughs> who knocked off some of his wives and some of your brothers and sisters in order to make sure that he hung around or he hung on to his, uh, uh, hung on to his throne. Herod, let's face it, Herod had rotten parents and this was his f the first blow that struck him in his KO uh, by sin. Uh, we know that children have their own character. Uh, there was a time uh, in America where popular child psychology uh, uh, taught that you know, a child is born, you have a blank slate. 
Those of you who are educators, you know what I'm talking about. You have a blank, it's a blank piece of paper. Whatever you write on it, that's it. Well, you know, that was a big thrill for parents. Wow, I've got a blank slate. You know, this child made in my image, boy, I'm going to write you know, perfection on this slate. But as most parents found out from that generation, <laughs> that was not accurate at all. Children are not a blank slate. They come with their own character. They come with free will. However, we also know that they learn things from all kinds of places and people, especially today. Boy, back in the day, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, we had four TV channels and uh, television only started at four o'clock in the afternoon. And the curse of all, you had to get up off the couch and walk over to the TV and change the channel. You know, I was the first uh, channel changer. My father said, used to say, get up and change, put it on two. Now wait a minute, put it on four. You know, so there was danger in those days, but today, wow, the parents today, I mean, forget TV, the internet, thousands of channels and sources for all kinds of information that is coming into your, into your home, into the mind of your child. However, in the end, the example and the teaching or lack of teaching from parents will serve as the norm for their own conduct. Parents of today, you won't be able to blame the internet if, you're, you know, if your child, because you have responsibility to monitor the internet, just like our parents had the responsibility to monitor those four channels, you know, if, if, if they didn't want us to you know, take in some bad things and bad scenes and, and, and other things. Uh, we need to remember that parents have a great impact on their children. I say that there's a, 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 um, a, 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 a survey that was at a survey that came out uh, about who uh, influences the kids the most. Very interesting survey. Uh, kids, you know, they, 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 they key off of their parents. And this uh, survey among American college students uh, several years ago tried to measure the most influential person in both young men and young women. And the researchers expected to find uh, perhaps peer groups, movie stars, internet personalities, athletes, you know, who were going to be the biggest influencer on children. And lo and behold, they discovered that the majority of young adults listed their fathers as the main influence for good or bad. Imagine that. And that's whether or not the father was there or not. He still was the major influence. In other words, kids were saying, I want to be just like my dad. Or they were saying, the last thing I want to be is like my dad. But it was always the dad. A heavy burden of responsibility and a big surprise. So the first punch, if you wish, wish at Herod Jr. came from a non-existent mother and an evil and power hungry father that patterned this behavior for his young mind. That's the first blow. Uh, let's talk about Herod and John the Baptist. This is where we're most familiar with him. Over in Mark chapter six, we'll talk about the second blow. Let's read six, uh, Mark six rather, verses 14 to uh, 18. Mark writes, and King Herod heard of it, for his name had become well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying, he is Elijah. They're speaking of Jesus here, of course. He's Elijah. And others were saying, uh, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. For Herod himself has sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your, uh, your brother's wife. So part of John's preaching consisted of denouncing the marriage of Herod 
uh, to Herodias. Uh, it was unlawful, he said, unlawful before the Jewish law. See, uh, Herod, rather, had made a pretense of being partly Jewish so he could ingratiate himself to the Jewish people. And so he kind of theoretically placed himself under the law of Moses. Now Herod was already married, here's the thing. But while he was in Rome on a, an official visit, he abandoned his wife and he eloped with Herodias and returned to, to Judah, imagine. <laughs> he's married, his brother's married, he's visiting Rome, he steals his brother's wife, there's no divorce here, he just steals her, takes her and they go back to Judah. To make matters worse, Herodias was also married and was the wife of Herod's stepbrother Philip and was also his stepniece by marriage. And so in this reckless marriage, we see another blow against Herod. And that's blow number two, Herod was lustful. The fact that he was abandoning his own wife, stealing his brother's wife, disgracing his family by marrying his own niece, and nothing to him because of what counted was the satisfying of his a sexual appetite. He did all of this in public and he didn't care. He wanted what he wanted. Even if it was sinful, even if it was disgraceful, even if it was against the law, he wanted what he wanted. We know later that his new wife Herodias will see this weakness in him and she will use it against him. This is a great example of how Satan works in our lives. He always encourages us to cultivate various sins and habits, thinking that we can enjoy them without consequence. But he is always preparing us for the time when he can spring the trap and use these things against us. And we'll see how, of course, uh, she used this particular thing against him at the right time. Let's keep reading. It says Herodias had a grudge against him, meaning against John the Baptist, because he kept talking about her in public, saying their marriage was unlawful. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so, for Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy uh, listening to him. And so Herodias wanted to kill John because he was weakening her position at court and with the people. Herod protected John because he knew who John was. Herod knew John, he was a true prophet of God, he was a holy man. And of course, killing him would not be popular. So Herod even enjoyed John's preaching. It, it filled him with challenge and mixed emotions. John's preaching was having an effect on him. His heart was not completely hard. That's the sad part of this story. Herod knew what he needed to do. He knew, he knew the right thing to do, and that was to release John and to repent of his sins, as John's preaching called everyone to do, and of course be baptized. Herod was close to this, but he was perplexed. He was of two minds. If he, if he pleased Herodias and killed John, the people and his conscience would be against him. If he responded to the preaching and released John, he would lose Herodias and the sinful pleasures that he enjoyed, but he would have a clear conscience coming out of the waters of baptism at John's hands. So here we see blow number three that struck Herod. He was morally weak. He was morally weak. Herod based the darkness more, excuse me, he loved the darkness rather, more than he loved the light. In John chapter three, verse 19, he saw the light, you know, he knew the right thing to do, but he loved sin too much. And that prevented him from going towards the light. You know, the number one reason why people refuse the gospel or fall from faith is that they love their sins way too much. They're morally weak. The reason for this is that they believe several false ideas planted in them by Satan. One of which is the pleasure of sin is just going to last. 
Anybody who has had a problem with alcohol or drugs knows that that is an awful lie right there. Anybody who has fallen to sexual sin outside of their marriage or whatever knows that this is just one big lie. Sin does not last. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that sin's pleasure, the Bible does not deny that there's pleasure in sin because if there was no pleasure in sin, who would do it? You know, if, if, if it was a sin to eat boiled spinach, you know, nobody would be in danger of you know, committing that particular sin, if you know what I mean. No, sin, there's pleasure in sin, all kinds of pleasure in sin, but the Bible tells us that pleasure is only for a season. And then comes the reckoning, and then comes the judgment. Hebrews eleven twenty five. Another thing, another lie people believe, there is no hell. There's no hell. Yet the Bible says that hell is real. It's a place of suffering. It's eternal. A uh, passage of scripture here, Mark 9. Jesus now himself. By the way, Jesus talks more about hell than any other you know, person in the Bible. People are always saying, oh, there's no hell. Jesus is love. Well, yeah, he is. But he talks about hell a lot. He said, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a good place to go. And yet Jesus promises that this place exists. Herod was caught between right and wrong and for a time, these were equally balanced before him because he was undecided. He was undecided. He was trying to maintain the stack, keep John alive, keep Herodias happy. And a lot of people do this. They work at balancing right and wrong without making a clear decision either way. A little bit of God, a little bit of sin, not too much to upset the balance have to make a decision. Of course, this is a dangerous situation to maintain because as we will see with Herod, it provides Satan with the opportunity to deliver the knockout punch. Let's read about the knockout punch, shall we? Mark 6, Mark writes, a strategic day came, when, and by the way, strategic for who? <laughs> well, for Satan, that's who. A strategic day came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. So this was a strategic day for Herodias, the agent of Satan, because she was scheming for a way to get rid of John. And it was also an important day politically for Herod. So in verse 22, we continue, it says, and when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you want and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And so Herodias' daughter, this is her daughter with Philip, her former husband. So Herodias' daughter pleases Herod. And there are of sexual undertones here in the term pleased. There's that old lust thing working in, uh, in Herod once again. The dance is pagan and sensuous and it's meant to arouse. Herod, in the excitement caused by the party, the wine, his own lust, makes a foolish promise. Foolish because the kingdom was not his to give. It belonged to the Romans. He was just a manager. He couldn't give anything away. <laughs> it was all talk, it was all bluster. And so he makes an oath that he will keep his promise no matter what. Mark writes, and she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in a hurry to the king and asked saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So Herodias completes her plan through her daughter, Salome, by the way, by making her ask for John's head, and, and she says, right away, 
I want it now. This way Herod could not put her off or use some delaying tactics in order to save face. In this scene we witnessed the final blow. Herod was proud. He was proud. Verse 26, and although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling uh, to, um, to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head, John the Baptist's head, and he went and had him beheaded in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. He didn't want to go back on his word even though his promise was stupid, that's the only word for it, stupid and sinful, because of his pride and the, that delicate balance he was trying to maintain, that balance was tipped in favor of sin and he committed a deadly one. He murdered God's prophet. I mean murder is murder, but to murder God's prophet, this is a bad, bad thing. The knockout punch moved him from indecision to perdition, from being a step away from heaven to falling into the pit of hell. And history tells us he never recovered, never. Now usually in boxing matches, they give you a replay, you know, watching it on TV, they give you a replay of the important rounds and especially the KO punch. So in our study of Mark here, or this particular passage, we can see how Herod was knocked out by sin, very briefly. First of all, it began with an evil example and a lack of moral or spiritual training by his parents. I mean, I could preach a sermon on just that one thing, we could go another half hour here, but I think you know exactly how important that is. And I, I may also say, in my opinion, the parents in this congregation are trying very, very hard to provide a good example and a good education uh, to, their, to their children. Why? Because it is so vitally important, that's why. Number two, it continued with a lifetime of pursuing sensual desires. Number three, there was a key moment when uh, there was indecision about doing the right thing at the critical point. And why did he fail? Because did he ever make the right decision at a critical point? You have to have practice at those things. Mom and dad, let your children make some decisions so that they can find out what it's like to make the wrong decision and what it's like to make the right decision. If you make all their decisions for them until they're 21 years old, they're not going to know how to make decisions. You have the wisdom, parents, to know how much rope to give them. Believe me, young people will take more seriously the things that they do if they know that they're responsible for making the decision and they're responsible for the consequences of that decision. <coughs> Parents need to train their children in making decisions and then dealing with the, you know, the fallout from their decision. That's, that's part of the parents' training. Unfortunately, too many times we think the parent's job is to make all the decisions. No, the parent's job is to help their children learn how to make decisions and how to deal with the consequences. So important. And then finally, back to our story, it finished with a foolish pride that would rather go to hell than admit fault. And we think, oh, that only happened 2,000 years ago. <laughs> I know a lot of people rather burn in hell than change their mind. And the reason that they'd rather burn in hell than change their mind, they don't really believe in hell. They just don't really believe in hell. They don't really believe that God will punish them. And yet the Bible is filled with examples of God punishing people because they disobeyed Him. I don't believe that we equal Herod in the degree of evil in our lives, certainly hope not, but I do think that the same pattern sometimes exists in our lives. 
All of us have certain sins, certain habits and attitudes that by themselves may not present a great threat to our faith. And so we continue to indulge in them or we justify or we rationalize them for that reason. It's not so bad, this habit I've got, it's not such a bad thing. You know? We don't see the harm or the possible damage of this little sin or this little bad habit or this unchristian attitude. We don't, we don't see how it'll cause any problems. But combined together by Satan, the right combination of our little sins at a critical moment can make us fall faster and further from God than we ever imagined, ever imagined. How many times people say, you know, yeah, people shouldn't drink and drive. Yeah, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't drink, that's a bad thing. We shouldn't drink and drive, you know. And people cheat on that a little bit. Well, I'm just saying, it's just, a, it's just one beer, you know. I'm just having a beer with my meal at the restaurant. You know, I've always found that so unusual. You have a restaurant, they put in a kitchen, they put in a bar, they sell booze, and then they have a huge parking lot to make sure that people have a place to park all their cars. <laughs> And you go for years, you know, ah, just a couple of beers, just a couple of beers, you know. And then one night, some guy crosses the street on foot on the red light, shouldn't be there, and you, a glass of wine and two beers after your supper, run that guy over. And your life is over. Your life as you knew it is over, period. It's a whole other life that you now have. Were you going too fast? No. But that little thing that you just you know, never really nailed down, combined with a one moment, you're just looking down to change the station on the radio. And that guy was crossing the street on the red light. He had no business being there, yeah. Put those three innocent things together and what do you have? You have one guy who's dead and you have another guy whose life is over. Don't you think, what do you think Jesus is you know, saying when he says through Peter that, that, that Satan is like a roaring lion looking who he can devour? He's looking for situations that he can put together so that he can destroy somebody. So the solution or the best defense for us, or Herod, is always the same. Number one, we need to acknowledge sin as sin as soon as we recognize it uh, as such in our lives. No playing around, no justification, no just this once, no it's not a big deal. We need to simply call it for what it is when we see it, I'm sinning. If you're always lying or fibbing or bending the truth to get your way, sooner or later that's going to get you into trouble. Number two, we need to ask God for help to deal with our <laughs> sins, obviously. Too many times we say, well, I can handle this, or tomorrow I'll quit, or you know, I'm just going to grow out of it, or it'll all go away, one day it'll all take care of itself. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters, sin never takes care of itself. <laughs> if you don't take care of it, then Satan will take care of it for you. The reason Jesus died on the cross is because we couldn't deal with or overcome sin in our lives by ourselves. We need someone to call on, and that someone is God. And we need someone to remove our sins, and that person is Jesus. And then, number three, we need to understand that we can be knocked out. Sometimes online, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I watch some boxing videos, you know, maybe great, great matches that I wasn't able to see because, you know, pay-per-view or whatever. And sometimes they have these uh, compilations, uh, you know, all kinds of compilations, you know, the great f people you know, who are driving uh, uh, golf buggies, you know what I'm saying, and who crash and fall out of them. You know, they, they put together some crazy videos. They have videos like that for boxing, but the subtitle is uh, 10 guys 
who were showing off who got knocked out. <laughs> and they show a clip of a boxer coming out and talking trash and you know, bragging and so on and so forth. And in the very first round, you know, 10 seconds into the match, you know, bang, you know, one punch and the guy's out like a light. It's, you know. Well, that happens to us. We're kind of bragging, you know, ah, that'll never happen to me. God wouldn't do that to me. We need to understand we, we can be that guy or that woman whose life is over because a combination of, of things have come together to take us down. You know, Muhammad Ali bragged that no one could get him and no one could knock him out. And that was true in the ring. But then he got Parkinson's disease. And then he had to have people lead him around you know, by the hand. Terrible thing, that disease. We need to walk humbly before the Lord, knowing that we're easily vulnerable to sin and we can be knocked out if we're not careful. We work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Why? Well, because it is possible to lose it if we're not careful, that's why. In this life, we will be knocked around. We will receive blows that will put us down from time to time. But if we're honest with ourselves about sin, if we rely on God for help and especially for forgiveness, if we're careful with our souls, nurturing them through prayer and worship and study and service, then we may be knocked down once in a while, but we'll never be knocked out. So my question to you, how's the fight going? How is your fight going with sin? <laughs> I should have asked another question before this one. Are you in a fight? <laughs> Are you in a fight with sin? And how is that fight going? Are you winning? Are you winning? Or are you, you know, taking a beating? Maybe you don't have the protection of Christ's blood to guarantee your victory. If not, come, come to the blood of Christ and, and be baptized in His name in order to receive forgiveness. Maybe you need to come to your corner. You know, the fighters, they're tired, that bell rings, you know, and they go to their corner and they sit on the stool and you see the, the, the trainer and the cut guy working on them and putting, you know, squirting water on them and giving them a pep talk, you can do this. The guy's been beaten up for nine rounds, you know, there's no way he's going to win. But I, you hear, you know, they, have the, they have the camera in there now and the microphone, oh, you got this, Bubba. You just got one more round to do and you'll be great, it'll be all right. And everybody watching knows that this guy is never going to win. <laughs> he just needs encouragement to finish that last round. Maybe you need to come to your corner. Maybe that's what you need, to come to your corner, get a little encouragement from the elders, prayers of the church, a Bible study to help you understand how to do the thing you want to do, how to overcome the sin that perhaps is crippling you or holding you back? If so, then come for the prayer of the elders and for the restoration. Whatever blows that you've received, Jesus can guarantee that you'll be standing when the bell rings if you come to Him where you're, when you are in trouble now or in the future. Well, that's our, our boxing uh, sermon. Uh, all kidding aside, uh, sin is a very serious thing and we're all guilty of it. We all struggle with it. So if there is in some way uh, that the elders can be of service to you or the ministers can be of service to you tonight, then we do encourage you to come forward now as Titus uh, leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand and sing that song? <laughs> 